The Wizard of the North A poem by Earl of Henry Thomas Little Ravensworth No rites accursed or incantations dire Awake the music of my slumbering lyre. Though Grisha's deathless bard might not disdain The cup of Circean and the siren's strain, And harps of loftiest harmony have rung The magic terrors of Medea's tongue. The balm of life renewed the dragon car, Earth's newborn champions mixed in deadly war. The babes devoted to a cruel fate, Neglected love, indomitable hate. Not such the bold intent, nor do I sing, The slaves gigantic of the lamp and ring, The stern enchanter whose unholy spell Eclipsed the moon and shook the powers of hell, The wandering eremite with beard of snow, With tottering footstep and with wrinkled brow, Dissembling hypocrite whose wicked art Could cloak the foulness of his lustful heart. Such dreams have fled in this enlightened age, Such dreams have charmed in Ariosto's page. For me may Merlin's mystic secrets rest, Mid Cambrian rocks and Taliesin's breast. By me unheeded, druid phantoms range, The ruinic altars of their rude stone hinge. And Odin howl his war song to the whale, Of rocking forests in the Norway gale. But hail, thou muse! that didst of old inspire, the mighty rhapsodies of Pindar's lyre. Whether in praise of gods he swept the strings, or sung the godlike deeds of hero kings, whose prowess dragged the centaur's rage to death, and quenched the terrors of Chimera's breath, or when, through Ellis's peopled realms afar, he told the triumphs of the sounding car, and gave to immortality the fame of wreathed victors in Olympia's game. Yet all abashed and awestruck, I adore thy power mysterious, and thine aid implore. For Byron wooed thee in thy native clime, mid wrong and robbery and war and crime. Ungenial elements, but his the power, to waken transport in affliction's hour, to cast the light of poesy on things, that virtue shrinks from, and explore the springs, of warring passions in the human breast, that seek no comfort and obtain no rest. Himself the victim of each fancied wrong, the mournful monument of all he sung, till the vexed spirit, working its decay, fretted the feeble tenement of clay. Be this at least his praise, his glowing mind formed glory's plans of freedom for mankind. And as of old, the Athenian minstrels cry, led Sparta's sons, to death or victory, so Byron rallied Europe to the fight, where power tyrannic strove with feebler right, snatched at last brand from Argos's funeral pyre, and kindled liberty's extinguished fire, impelled the patriot to the battle plain, cheered the survivor, deified the slain, told how their mighty sires by force rolled back, barbaric legions on their homeward track. How Athens strewed with Persian wrecks the sea, How Sparta triumphed at Thermopylae. Then in the bosom of regenerate Greece, Breathed his last sigh for concord and for peace. But thou hast spread thy pinions, muse, And left the radiance beaming on Parnassus's cleft, The leafy shadows of Castalia's rill, Olympus's height and Pindus's snow-clad hill, to fix the glories of thy mountain throne by Tweed's enchanted stream on Ilden's triple cone. For on these banks abode the wizard white that stayed the rover in her airy flight, the bard of Scotia's olden time, whose song each haunted cairn and echoing rock prolong, the sage enchanter whose uplifted wand over past and present held supreme command. For even as Tweed's broad surface clear and deep Reflects each tufted knoll and castled steep, So in his magic mirror we may trace The quaint old garb, the forgotten face. Princes and heroes pass the changing scene, The lion conqueror and the virgin queen, The Norman baron and the Saxon thane, The collared bondsman and the feudal train. The turbaned emir on his settled steed Skirming the desert with a whirlwind speed. 
the haughty Templar Saracenic crew, the lowly Palmer and the cringing Jew, the gentle Troubadour, the Red Cross Knight, the Council Sage, the spirit stern fight, the stern enthusiast and the churchman stayed, the melting lover and the timid maid, the mitred Pilate and the lofty peer, the stately dame, the gallant chevalier. While frequent at their master's beck, repair fantastic shades and viewless forms of air. Nor less the wild localities amaze, the mind entranced and charm the enraptured gaze. Now through the howling wilderness we roam, the sky our canopy, the sands our home. Where dark asphaltous slimy sea rolls, o'er the smoking wrecks of that unhallowed shore, where once the accursed cities of the plain, mid vineyards towered and fields of waving grain, ere yet their crimes, too great to be forgiven, provoke the vengeance of insulted heaven. Sulphurous vapors load with death the wave, within whose bosom Siddam found her grave. Nor aught relieves the weary pilgrim's glance along the unbroken desert's drear expanse. Nor tree nor bush their leafy screen display to suns that flash intolerable day. Or now we navigate the roaring deep, beneath the gloom of frowning sunburst steep, where clanging sea fowl hang their giddy nest, wheel in midair, or skim the billow's crest. Where Scandinavian pirates moored of old their dragon bark and stormed each mountain hold, where many a saga's uncouth legend sings, the bloody conquests of the fierce sea kings. And many a mystic rhyme and warlike dance prolong the records of antique romance, where the vexed spirit of the northern coast mourns the long twilight in his realm of frost, and the tall sea snake or the kraken's form loom huge and hideous through the coming storm, or green-haired mermaids chant the tuneful lay to midnight echoes in the moonlit bay. Or lo, where kilted clansmen crowd before the highland towers of stern Macolamore, whose pennoned barks and close reefed galleys line in long array the shores of fair Loch Fine, while ruthless acts of violence and blood pollute the current of that silver flood, the barred portcullis and the loophole great, the flanking battlements, the frowning gate, the gory scaffold and the severed head impaled aloft upon the rude stockade. The plaited corpses of the wild and free, the muffled group beneath the gallows tree, the wailing coronach of stifled grief, proclaim the terrors of the feudal chief. But why prolong examples and retrace our lingering steps through each familiar place, or strive with dull minuteness to rehearse a tedious catalog in measured verse? All that a poet's genius ever conceived, all that a painter's science ever achieved, the cloistered monastery, the ruined tower, the lordly mansion, or the sylvan bower, the busy throng of men, the tumult's roar, the silent mountain, and the lonely shore, the foaming cataract, the forest break, the red sun gleaming in the western lake, the boundless prospect lost in distant floods, wide checkered plains and intermingled woods, the vexed waves over ocean wildly driven, the dread magnificence of varying heaven. These hath he seen, and with reflected light, with these he strikes our senses, charms our sight. As through the burnished lens each object near, on the dark chamber's floor is pictured clear. The pleased spectator in each passer-by discerns an image of reality, while ships and buildings, sea and sky, illume the living prospect in the dusky room. Such powers are his, and still he conjures more, in swift succession from his boundless store. Historian, painter, poet, he alone, as all in each conspicuous hath shown, viewed nature's sweet varieties and sung a painter's study with a poet's tongue, caught the clear features of each transient age, and stamped the portrait on his glowing page. To such all praise, but higher far be given, to that the nearer attribute of heaven, that mightier power and more exalted art, that paints the workings of the human heart. 
Vast though the differences of place or clime, Of wintry tempest or of summer's prime, The rebel heart of man, inconsistent still, Twixt each extremity of good or ill, But oft times wavering like the balanced scale, Or quivering vain the sport of every gale. Now low, now high, by counter movements driven, now seared by blast from hell, now fanned by breath from heaven. Lured by each passion, colored by each thought, true to no guide, by no example taught, alternately man's tyrant and his slave, cloyed with possession, destined still to crave. This wayward heart and its chameleon die, transcends all miracles of earth and sky, and mocks the keen inquirer that would ask its inmost secrets, or remove the mask that veils each varied purpose from the ken of its possessor or his fellow men. To most denied, yet not denied to him, this guarded magazine of pride and whim, this sealed and secret box whose contents he displays to daylight by a master key, this labyrinth of error traced by few, save him whose art Dedalian owns the clue. This Gordian ravel of intricacy, which some may sever, he alone untie. This strange enigma, dark to vulgar eyes. This mass of endless inconsistencies. This human heart in fine, to him reveals all that it thinks or knows or sees or feels. This heart by him of its offenses shriven, may choose the better part and learn to be forgiven. Lo, the stern regicide, whose startled gaze the portrait of his murdered lord surveys. Now nature shrinks from that calm, steady eye that gleams in uncomplaining majesty, and wild emotions choke the undaunted breath that doomed its master to a felon's death. Though self-deluding conscience strive to fling her shadowy vestments over the bleeding king, in dark fanaticism advance to plead the dire compulsions of an awful deed till roused ambition in a loftier tone, peel his high summons to the vacant throne, and hopes now dawning into promise, roll, prophetic visions over the conqueror's soul. Where all but regal splendor shall wait the politic protector of the state, and England bow beneath the dread command of his, the male usurper's, iron hand. Or turn we where the blaze of knightly fame glows like a furnace in the heart of game. That loyal, bold, uncompromising heart that scorned the cowards, load the traitor's part. By glory guided and by danger fired, by duty nerved, by chivalry inspired. In converse courteous, as becomes the knight, in council sage, invincible in fight. And, oh, that aught should cloud a shield so clear, alike unmoved by mercy as by fear. O oh, loyalty, thou sacred generous name, what gallant spirits hast thou led to fame? Yet whence this fond enthusiasm, or why, cling to the wreck of fallen dynasty? Granted the state requires a sovereign hand to sway the scepter over a subject land. Kings are but men, and worthier may be found than most whom right legitimate hath crowned. Then, if a king presume to violate, by word or deed his compact with the state, dethrone, discard him, and transfer the rule to some mob-chosen, more obedient tool. So sophists reason, and so knaves may teach, fools to believe the doctrine that they preach. But loyalties abjures the sophist plan, for rearing treason on the rights of man, records his sworn allegiance and lays down his wealth, his life, his all, to save the crown. While calmer reason need not shrink to ask What ruin lurks behind the rebel's mask? Bold though the pretext, plausible the cause Of outraged rights and violated laws. What rights are sacred, or what laws are known To those who sap the basis of the throne? Who sneer at good, and with a belial's tongue Perplex distinctions between right and wrong? Root out long-cherished feelings in exchange Plant envy, hate, suspicion, and revenge. Foment sedition and asunder force, the loosened bonds of social intercourse. 
Goad ignorance to madness, get in chain, a frenzied people in a party's train, then pander to rebellion's thirsting brood, the price of freedom in a monarch's blood. Curse be such arts, upon their author's head, may earth and heaven their direst vengeance shed. For him may keen remorse and fear prepare, the bed of anguish and the poison fare. The shirt of mail that wards the assassin's knife shall add new terrors to his dastard life. The widow's malison, the orphan's tear, load the sad course of each declining year. Till all the blood his crimes had caused to flow bring retribution of eternal woe. Yet far the thought from me and from my friend, beneath the scourge of tyranny to bend, or basely sacrifice on crouching knee, at grandeur's shrine the birthright of the free. But anarchy, the tyrant overthrown, sets up a thousand in the place of one, and loyalty resists the blow alike, that rebels threaten, or that despots strike, and best secures fair freedom's hallowed dower, by fearing God and honoring lawful power. Such the pure ray of chivalry that glows within the hearts of Claverse and Montrose, sheds a last gleam on Ivor's broken flower, and gilds the night of Ditchley's dying hour. More had we sung, and haply touched again, the chord of sympathy never struck in vain. Wept with St. Leonard's lily, traced the source of lofty principle and moral force that fortified her sister's soul to brook from angered majesty the searching look. Till nature's pleading, though in phrases mean, Drew unreluctant tears from England's queen. Or we had owned the terrors of that hour, When spectres walk abroad and spells have power, When the lorn soul overburdened and oppressed Would fain from trouble flee and be at rest. Or coward conscience conjures up within The deeper gloom of unrepented sin, And ghastly visions to the mind portend A doomed existence a disastrous end? Such thy forebodings, gallant Fergus, when the phantom crossed thee in the lonely glen, and shadowed forth to thy devoted race a future fraught with ruin and disgrace. More had we sung, for once we thought to bring, even to its shrine this votive offering, and hoped perchance the mighty master's smile might cheer the purpose and reward the toil delusive hope no more that lip hath power to enrich the memory of the fleeting hour or summon from the past a wondrous store of knightly deeds and legendary lore that eye is darkened now whose mental sight could pierce the regions of eternal night still is that heart whose pulses varying throb beat in high sympathy with half the globe and quench that hallowed fire whose radiance shone like heaven's sown orb throughout each circling zone. Mourn, Caledonia, mourn thy son, and shroud thy sorrowing faces in universal cloud. His shell lies broken by the tinkling rill, his harp is silent on the lonely hill. The dreary wailing of the autumnal wood, the melancholy murmur of the flood, the shrieking ghosts of ancient heroes slain, borne on the night mist o'er the battle plain. The hoarse wind roaring on the troubled lake Proclaim the doleful tidings as they wake. The mountain echoes in their rocky bed That Scott is numbered with thy mighty dead. Mourn, Britain, mourn the extinction of a mind Formed to delight, instruct, and bless mankind. The true and steady patriot unsubdued By clamor of the giddy multitude, Alike unwilling to relax the hand that holds the rein with firm but mild command. Or on the other side too close to draw the cheeks of just authority and law. Historian of our glories, well for thee to have died before that hour thou livest to see. When faction bared his arm and tumult's cry yelled through the virtuous home of royalty. When Scotland saw foul scorn and outrage shed upon her sage's gray uncovered head and England blushed for the unmanly wrong done to her chief by London's rabble throng, done on that day whose deeds from age to age shall beam emblazoned on the historic page. When trumpet tongued renown her clarion blue in triumph over the field of Waterloo, and rearing freedom's banner to the sky, 
delivered Europe shouted victory. Howl on these base dogs, and strong in numbers close, around the lion in his calm repose. Exhaust your petty vengeance while ye may, and wound with slander whom ye fear to slay. The everlasting sun his high career, majestic holds through each revolving year. Though clouds obscure his disk and tempests blow, and wild confusion on the plains below. Mobs have their day, and factions reign is over. Reptiles may crawl where reptiles crawled before. The laureled hero and the sacred bard from future generations claim reward, and to remotest ages unforget shall live the names of Wellington and Scott. Mourn him all nations, wheresoever the song of faith and hope is raised from the Christian throng. Where bells have knolled to church, at morn or even, and revelation points the way to heaven. Where knowledge hath unrolled her ample page, rich with the spoils of every clime and age, or language renders in another tone, thoughts from strange lands, and labors not her own. Or wheresoever barbaric tribes afar, renouncing deeds of violence and war, have owned the common bond of social life that substitutes security for strife. And dawning reason pours abroad her light on realms emerging from Sumerian night. Mourn universal nature, mourn for he, nature's own poet, living worship thee. He is thine heritage, his bones let death return into the soil that gave him breath. And Caledonia still record with pride that Scott with her had lived, with her had died. But now his immortality of mind belongs to nature and to all mankind. True genius linked to no peculiar place o'erleaps the narrow bounds of time and space. Its luster fills the world, its name survives, the fleeting records of a thousand lives, and unborn myriads shall revere that name, graved in the temple of eternal fame. Ye that have known the subject of my song, the notes of grief in tenderer strain prolong. Recall those pleasant hours that glided by, lit with the sunshine of his glowing eye. When all inspired, the poet would rehearse some stirring deed in legendary verse, and wake to memory the wild alarms that roused the border chivalry to arms. Or when the changing tone, pathetic, low, rolled neath the shadows of his darkening brow, and some sad tale of Scotland's olden time recorded vengeance, suffering, and crime. So clear the river, dancing in the ray, reflects the brilliance of the summer day, or murmurs mournfully beneath the shade of high overreaching rocks and gloomy forest glade. In him we saw that rarest union joined of boundless talents with the simplest mind. No bitter controversies vexed his brain, no wit that wantoned in another's pain. The invidious cavil or the critic's sneer provoked no anger and inspired no fear. The shafts of malice flew, but harmless fell, for who that wrote so much ever wrote so well? Who else can look upon that scene of strife, the labors of literary life, nor wish one single page, one single word, for virtue's sake, unwritten or unheard? Be this thy glory, Scott, how few may crave an equal right to hopes beyond the grave, that one undeviating moral still is drawn from every tale of good or ill, that vice, however successful for a time, incurs at last the penalty of crime. But he that hopes for happiness above, on earth that values friendship, fame, or love, must keep the path of duty rarely trod, be just to man, and faithful to his God. That thou hast taught us this, the world can tell, reap thy reward in heaven, on earth, farewell. <laughs>